Your reasons for listening to this show, well, those are your own. But just keep in mind that the views, information, or opinions expressed on the Tuttle Daily Podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of our sponsors. Yeah, it's called free speech, people. Nobody's forcing you to listen. One-of-a-kind shades made to order by Vaporshades.com. Vapor Shades designs the outer layer of the sunglasses just like a wrap on a car. They customize your sunglasses, marbling the paint. The end result is no two pair of sunglasses are alike. Yours will be completely unique to you. Check us out at Vaporshades.com. Use promo code TUTTLE for 15% off your entire order. Get ready for your daily dose of TUTTLE. Uh, the all-time greatest uh, intern slash producer we've ever had, of course, Tuttle. Tuttle in Florida. From the Vapor Shades Hobo Fish Camp, it's the Tuttle Daily Podcast. Anarchy! 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 No wonder nobody likes you, Tuttle. Everything's a goddamn debate. Welcome to another edition of the Tuttle Daily Podcast. Hope you guys are having a wonderful day so far. I apologize. Last night, I did not do a live stream on YouTube. But before I get into why I wasn't able to do a YouTube live stream last night, I'm going to tell you how you can get a hold of me. Tuttle at gmail.com. That's Tuttle with two Ds. T-U-D-D-L-E at gmail.com. Now, if you'd like to leave me a voicemail, you can easily do that. 407 407- Two seven zero three zero four four. So the reason that I was not able to do a Tuttle Daily Podcast live stream was uh, one of my subscribers, he's local, lives in Delan. Uh, his son, they played Little League Baseball, and uh, his kid is in the 10 to 12-year-old range. So he's about to move up to Senior League, but he's a pitcher, and he wanted me to come out because he knew that I pitched in high school played a little bit of college ball. He wanted me to come out, look at his kid. I know that sounds weird and creepy. You know, I I always have said, I always think it's weird when somebody is a coach of a baseball team when they don't have a kid on that team. See, it kind of sucks that people look at it that way. Maybe it's just me, but I've always felt that way. And, And it sucks because there's so many teams and so many people that know baseball very, very well that could be amazing coaches, but they're going to be, yeah, oh, man, he doesn't have a kid, man. What's up with him? Need to check his hard drive. So I went out to the uh, Chipper Jones complex in DeLand, uh, the one right across the street from Melching Field. And I went out there, and I got to tell you, the kid actually has the natural velocity. Velocity, yeah, it is something that you can teach. But there are just some people that, that just have cannons for arm. The only thing is, the kid is a little wild when it comes to some of the pitches. But there's just a few minor things. See, this is why I wish when I was younger pitching, we had these cell phone cameras. You know, I, I just ended up getting the iPhone 12 Pro and the slow motion. Oh, my God, it is so amazing how much detail you can see. And I went home after uh, filming, breaking down the video. I'm not going to share the video because it's a minor and, you know, that's their own thing. But I broke it down. There's a few couple of things that need to be worked on. You know, a lot of people think pitching comes all from the arm and it doesn't. It, It comes from the leg. So you need to work on the leg, pushing off, pulling the glove forward. And coming in there, your your body all has to be in motion. And that's something you can see because of all the great camera phones we have now. I told you guys a story. My dad ended up borrowing somebody's like, and it wasn't even a handheld. It was one of the ones, old ones, that you put on your shoulder. But you weren't able to slow it down the way that you can now with uh, the uh, cell phones. It's It's really, really crazy. Probably be playing in the majors right now if I would have had something like I got right now with this iPhone Pro 12. It's amazing. You can see every single detail and you can break down your mechanics. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about, uh, my cousin Billy, he, uh, the big Buccaneers fan that we had or I had on the show to discuss the Bucs playoff run, talk to him right after the Super Bowl. 
and he trains triathletes. He wants me to try to do a triathlon. Now, you guys know that I've gotten in shape. That was one of my big goals during 2020, right after I got fired from the Bubble the Love Sponge show. And I did. I've gotten in shape. Now, I'll admit, my cardio is not the best. I run a little bit, but I also think that it has a lot to do with the shoes that I'm wearing. Because I end up hurting my knees. I get this thing called shin splints and runner's knee. And I think, it, I think it all has to do with my stride. I think it also has a lot to do with the shoes that I'm wearing. Because I have not owned an expensive pair of running shoes, I think, in my whole entire life. And I think maybe that would, that's a lot of my problem when it comes to my knee. Now, you also got to remember, I'm not going to be doing a full triathlon. It would be like a quarter or an ha a half of a triathlon that's swimming, biking, and running. Now, I've told you guys my luck that I have on two wheels. I always hurt myself on two wheels. Do not know why. I missed and I, I missed my uh, final season of senior league baseball all stars because I was ri or riding to my buddy Howard's house on my bicycle and then the brake cable ended up uh, breaking loose. By the way, my dad was the one that pit the bike together because me and my dad, me and my dad ended up being in a bowling uh, league and we ended up winning the whole goddamn thing. And I want a brand new mountain bike, and but we had to put it together. And I guess we didn't put the brake cable on well enough. And the thing came off, got tangled up into the spokes, ass overhead, right over the handlebars. And I ended up breaking my wrist of my glove hand. And I tried and tried and tried to be able to get that, that glove over that cast. It just was not happening. So... Like I said, back, back to what I was saying, I'm not good on two wheels at all. So in the swimming, growing up in Florida, I know how to swim. But from what my cousin said, with these triathlons, you're actually swimming in a group of people. And people will, like, I guess, draft off of you. I didn't even know if that was, like, possible in swimming. But he said it's a little bit more difficult than what you think, even though I've, I've been swimming my whole entire life. And I would like to hear from you. Is this a good idea, a bad idea? Because he does a podcast that is about triathletes, and, I, and then I do my podcast. And, and he thought it would be great content for us to cross-promote each other. I could come on his podcast, give him an update on my progress and training. And then he could come on my show. He could talk about how well I'm doing. I'd like to hear from you. Email me, Tuttle at gmail.com. That's Tuttle with two Ds, T-U-D-D-L-E at gmail.com. Or leave me a voicemail, 407-270-3044. Like I, I, the reason I'd like to hear from you is, is that is that something you guys would even be interested in listening to or following my progress? Because I'm a little scared. Even though I'm in the best shape of my life, I just, I, I, I don't want to fail. I hate failing. And I guess I've had a lot of failures in my life. So I probably should not even, like, be worried about that. But I don't want to go through all the extra hard work. Yes, it'll probably get me in better shape and stuff. But the last thing I want to do is get on that bike and hurt myself. Lose all the progress. Because when you're 40, you don't heal as quickly as you used to when you're younger. You know, the last time I got hurt on two wheels was the night that me and Trace were hanging out at Klim Racing Incorporated, where I lived. I, I, I lived above Bubba's Race Shop there for a little bit. And, you know, those mopeds that you see Bubba riding around on, he just got them fixed. Me and Trace... Had already gone through two bottles of Jameson, drunk as fuck. I kept daring Trace to hit me in the face as hard as he could. And I annoyed him enough, and he did it. He knocked the ever-living shit out of me. And then we were like, hey, 
now that that's over with, let's take the Vespas. Let's take the mopeds out. And we did. And I wiped out. I, I tore my skin up bad. Uh, my knees were destroyed. It looks like that I've had like eight or nine knee surgeries after falling on that. And it wasn't that smooth asphalt. It was that asphalt that, that's very, very rough. Kind of like that coarse sandpaper. Oh, man. I, it, it took a couple of months before I was back into any type of shape at all. But I'd, seriously, I want to hear from you. Is this something that you guys would like to see me trying? Do you think it would be great content? 407-270-3044. Going to take a quick break. When I come back, going to be speaking with freelance journalist Dana Lewis. Dana has covered some of the biggest international stories. He, uh, he was a wartime reporter, and I had a great conversation with him about the media, some of the biggest stories he's ever covered, and that's coming up right after the break. You are listening to the Tuttle Daily Podcast. He's a nerd. I've only been arrested one time. A radio personality. Professionally, I'm not in the best position that I've ever been in. And hot talk satirizer? You would think with everything that's going on, a Caucasian like myself wouldn't be able to randomly talk to an African-American or a minority. You're listening to the Tuttle Daily Podcast. Wish you could have just flown and had your vehicle arrive a day or two later so you can enjoy more time doing what's important to you? Well, you can. Just give Starfire Transport a call. Let the professionals do the driving while you're flying. Starfire Transport specializes in RV and auto transport. They'll also haul watercraft from boats to PWCs, cargo trailers, and more. Service available throughout the continental United States. So don't wait. Call Brian today at 574-349-4193 or 989-751-6106 for your next move. 10% off for veterans past or present. Also, make sure to tell them Tuttle sent you for an additional discount. That's Starfire Transport. Do you have something you want to say? Hey, what kind of preacher is you? Leave Tuttle a voicemail. Because you're kind of ignorant. Especially if you think he's being an asshole. No mega bitch. Will your hurtful comments offend Tuttle? No, baby. Call the show at 407-270-3044. No, baby. Welcome back to the Tuttle Daily Podcast. This is actually an interview that I am so excited for because... I've talked about journalism and a lot of people not understanding the, di the difference between opinionated journalism and real journalism, because I don't I don't think we have that much nowadays anywhere in, in any country right now on the line with me is Dana Lewis. How are you, Dana? Hi, Toto. I, it's, so let me let me ask you. So you call yourself a freelance journalist? Am I correct by saying that? Yeah, I'm a freelance journalist working out of London. Yeah. Now, ex explain how freelance works. Like you go out and cover the story and you sell it to somebody like uh, explain the definition freelance for my audience well, that may not understand it. I actually used to have a full time job once, but um, <laughs> it, I worked for NBC News. I worked for Canadian TV. I worked for Fox News before that. So my spent my whole career working full-time for networks, um, American television networks mostly. But then mm -hmm. when I came to London, I, I uh, left my employer because I wanted to, wanted to put my kids in, in school here in Britain. And mm -hmm. so I went freelance. So I worked for Al Jazeera. I also worked for another 24-hour news network. Um, and I, so what I may, they may call me in and some freelancers kind of work on the story. They go to the story and then they sell, um, their report. Whereas with me, I mean, because I've been doing this so long that people tend to know me a little bit more in the news industry. So they call, call you in for analysis a lot. Yeah. So, so what explain, is there any difference between the news in the UK than the United States of America, because I don't think people realize the tabloids are, you know, they think the paparazzi is bad here in the United States, but man, they, it can get really brutal over there in the UK. 
Well, I mean, yeah, I'm Canadian, so I'm, I didn't grow up in the generation of tabloids. I grew up in very, you know, middle of mm -hmm. the road, don't give your opinion, straight news, much like, you know, ABC or uh, NBC, which I think are, high, or CBS, I think are high quality television news networks. And I mean, they used to be better, but I still, I still think they're very good. Well, who, I mean, the tabloids who, here... There yeah. are re regular newspapers, and then there are the tabloids, which, you know, have a sunshine girl and tend to be flashy. And, you know, to a large degree, they're gossip rags. And they, mm -hmm. you know, run around trying to get the, the, the juiciest photograph of the biggest celebrity they can find. And they're driven by personality news. And so it's a huge multi multi-million dollar industry. Yeah, because the the reason I, I bring that up, um, recently Oprah talked to Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, everybody. I mean, it had like 17.1 million viewers here in the United States, but uh, not Pierce as big Morgan, as your podcast total. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 what I what I'm trying to say is Pierce Morgan is one of the guys that yeah. is just on everybody's ass. And he got called out on some of his stuff and he walked off the set. Um, I don't know. Have you seen the video uh, at all? You no, know, I watched it live this morning because I mm -hmm. watched Pierce in the morning. And, you know, for people, Americans that don't know the name, Pierce Morgan was a editor of a newspaper here, a tabloid uh, newspaper. And then he later on became the host of After CNN, Larry, King. Larry King show. He took over for Larry King. Um, and then he came back to Britain and he, he hosts ITV in the morning, which is kind of the direct competition of the BBC, which is very conservative. ITV tends to be a little more dicey. And Pierce is very opinionated. And yesterday, um, it begins, it begins the, um, on Monday morning after Oprah's airing of the interview with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, he came out and and said basically that Meghan Markle was lying uh, about depression and that her allegations that somebody in the royal family said to Harry, who said to her that, um, you know, what color is the skin going to be of your first baby and yeah. what will that mean, which is interpreted widely but as a very racist thing. Um, you know, he said that she was, you know, salacious, spray painting, uh, the entire royal family, how could she do it, um, that, that rather than naming a, a person, they've come out and they slandered everybody in Buckingham Palace, including the Queen. Um, and so oh, let's he, not act like you know, Pierce hasn't done that before, though. I mean, for real. <clears throat> well, he's he's done that before with Meghan. He, he's not a fan of Meghan Markle's. And then this morning he called in one of his his weather uh, reporters and who is of, of, you know, mixed race. Mm. And he's, and, and that reporter came on the set and really went after Pierce and, and said, you know, you've, you've gone after the, the Meghan Markle and Harry un, very unfairly. Um, I, I couldn't even listen to what you were saying on Monday in <laughs> Pierce, like a big drama queen, you know, got up from his own set and said, I don't have to listen to this. And he walked off the set. Now, he came back, though, and he carried on his broadcast later on. But, you know, he's very, very good at doing things like that that wind up on Instagram and on Twitter and in the in the tabloids themselves the next day. So, you know, was it staged? I, I don't think so. He looked genuinely uh, angry and hurt um, at, you know, the, what was being said about him. Um, so, I mean, a lot of people will agree with him and a lot of people will disagree with him and think he's horrible. Could he be a higher gun by the royal family? Like, hey, Pierce, stick up for us. You know, I mean, it might be good for you in the future. It might be, you know, you're going to get more inside stories and stuff. No, you know, it's like you're, I think no? Pierce is genuinely middle of the road. guy. I mean, he's after the government all the time. He, he, you know, he holds people to account and he does so very effectively in some issues like COVID and the handling of the pandemic by the by the government of Prime Minister Boris Johnson. I mean, he really has been after them, and rightly so. They've bungled so many different things here. So, you know, I, I think in this case, he really stood up for the Queen. And yeah. he, 
and he felt that she was being painted uh, by Prince Harry and by by Meghan Markle with with this, you know, very tough characterization of the palace, and he thought it was really unfair. And I think he emotionally responded to that. But okay. you know, I mean, I I think he went over the top. But are 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 people getting to the point where like they're eventually going to do away? with the royal family because the reason i asked this so like if i as an american if i had to pay taxes to a, a, a family that really doesn't have any say when it comes to law anymore like i would be upset about that well i mean there's a great tradition um i'm canadian right so we're part of mm -hmm. the commonwealth yeah um there's a great tradition of the queen. People love her. They are gr deeply loyal to her. I think they feel that she led the nation. Um, you know, so she is the constitutional head of state, by the way. So she, it's they not do only things, being a figurehead. But the, and, uh, now, 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 can you answer me this question? Does the queen have to, like, here in the United States, the president vetoes something? Does the queen have to give her blessing on laws that are passed or or does it really matter what she thinks you know i'm not a constitutional expert on on britain and the queen but i do know like she has things that go beyond ceremonial like um the speech from the the throne when the government is first elected and they announce their agenda um for the, the coming term she yeah, will I've, read it she will read yeah, it. I, she I, will go I, into I, Parliament and read it. I, um, I actually saw her first one that she ever did. And and to see like a young Queen Elizabeth was yeah. pretty cool. And I thought she was amazing at that at such a young age. And if you want to dissolve Parliament, for instance, or, or sorry, if you want to dissolve government, um, the prime minister would go to see her. If you want to form a government after your election, let's say you don't have a clear majority here. So, I, mm -hmm. you know, in the U.S., it's first past the post or whatever. You get 51 percent and you're elected. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> here you might have a minority government where the conservatives don't get enough seats for a majority. So they have to form a minority, maybe with the, the liberal party or the liberal Democrats or with the, the the labor party. And they would have to go to her and they would have to ask to form a government. Now, a lot of that's ceremonial, but mm -hmm. I mean, she oversees that constitutionally. So she's not just a figurehead. But the, I mean, the point is that um, there, there's a great tradition of, of the monarchy here. By the way, there's some of the biggest landowners still in Britain um, and, and, and one of the wealthiest. Uh, that's why they call them the firm. You know, they're, they're one of the wealthiest institutions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there are people who could say, let's do away with the monarchy. And, and th they have done so in the past. I mean, there is even a movement here to get rid of them. But I think generally a lot of the, the British support them. But, yeah, this puts a dent uh, in, in the armor of, of yeah. Buckingham Palace and a very severe one. And that's probably why they're going to have to come out and talk about this interview with Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. Oh, you have to. On the line with me right now is Dana Lewis. Dana, uh, tell people how they can find out about your podcast and be able to find you anywhere on social media. Oh, that's really kind of you. I do. Uh, my podcast is mainly international news and it's called Backstory with Dana Lewis. And you can find it on Stitcher, on Apple, anywhere you listen to podcasts. And I also do a daily newsletter um, called it's Dana Lewis dot Substack. Dot com. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people write newsletters on Substack. But what you know, it wasn't my intention to get involved in doing a newsletter because it's a it's a lot of heavy lifting doing that every day or every second day. But I think, you know, we've <clears throat> especially after the storming of the Capitol and QAnon and so much disinformation on the internet, people have said to me, why don't you do kind of what you know, a, a guide to the news, what you think is newsworthy, and maybe with some links telling people what they can read. Because I honestly think that we are having a generation of conspiracy theory, yeah. um, you know, mi misguided, not read in, 
uh, people who are driving into the ditch because they don't understand what is reality and what is, you know, some silly stuff and dangerous are, stuff. Are, 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 are there going to have to be rules made? Because I, I've talked about this on my show a lot, okay? Back when our founding fathers were, were writing up our Constitution and our amendments and stuff, they didn't think, hey, man, guess what? We're going to be able to watch a box. It's going to have moving pictures, and, and those moving pictures is going to give us the daily news. And, you know, they didn't know about that back in the day. But we had to create laws like the FCC to to govern, you know, I what can be governable. I, I no, think you, you don't think can govern media. some of it by pulling off the crazy stuff and the the stuff that is 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 making people take up arms. Um, you know, with freedom of speech comes responsibility, right? And you cannot spread hatred. You cannot. Uh, condone or incite violence so those things have to come down and they have to be taken down by big tech or those big tech firms may find themselves having to pay damages to people yeah um, but you know things like right-wing cable um, that that has emerged you know it's a very tricky thing because look when I entered the when I entered the news business this is mm -hmm. going back a few decades now. I don't want to say how many because I'm getting embarrassed about it, Tuttle. But you could not, first of all, news was not for profit. So newsrooms weren't expected to make money. And there was a tradition that salespeople, like I worked in radio at first, salespeople were never allowed on our side of the building. So there were no commercial interests allowed to influence news directly or indirectly, or even for us to feel the effect that somebody was paying the bills. So we better not investigate that corporation oh. or that company or whatever. Right. I, I dude, what? Yeah. I, I worked with a radio guy by the name of Jim Phillips. Uh, he did three to seven here in Orlando and he never took free stuff from like businesses and 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 tickets to of like uh, Orlando Magic games because no 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 of he, course he, not sports guys could do it but yeah. we could never like go cover a news conference by Kodak and get a free camera or something you, I mean you could never ever compromise yourself or the big you know they used to have these huge car shows in Detroit where they launched the next generation or the new cars of mm -hmm. that year and they used to try and fly in reporters they. You know, there was huge scandal when there were prostitutes involved and alcohol and all that. And absolutely real journalists, mainstream journalists were never allowed to participate in any of that and take any of that. Now, because you don't want to be biased, right? You don't, don't want to be biased. Want you want to be neutral. You want to be a white knight of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, it is a noble, ethical profession that and it means so much to democracy and who we are and the foundations of, of the nation. Now, I'm sure there's people listening to me now going, <laughs> are you kidding me? Like, are you seriously journalists? Those, you know, horrible people who torque the news and never tell the truth and fake news. And uh, really, I think it's a highly professional, great, um, you know, profession. And my colleagues, my friends and generations of them are, mm -hmm. are very ethical, honest people who feel that they stand up for the little person and they're the voice of, of the people who cannot. Okay. Speak. And they have to stand up to big government, big military, police, everybody to, on, on behalf of people. That's who you represent. Now that See, we have a tradition now mm -hmm. of media breaking left and right. And that just can't, I mean, it's not working. No, it, it's not because, you know, see, I, I blame them all. Like everybody's like, oh, you know, they'll want to call me a liberal. But I think CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, Fox Business, all the 24 hour CNN, it, uh, they're all biased one way or the other, if you like it or not. In my opinion, they are. Big gap of silence, because I, I don't quite see it as plainly as you might, but I think the right started it and, mm -hmm. and they saw, look, I worked for Fox news for a while. I was a mm -hmm. foreign correspondent for them in Baghdad and then in Moscow after leaving NBC news, but daytime programming at Fox news was straight news. Basically 
And then you had personalities on at night who took a, a, right, a right Republican view of the world. Lou Dobbs, Lou Dobbs just uh, got, got let go too. And I mean, he took a big, big, I mean, like he, he never talked bad about Trump at all. It was just like, it well, was just it was so apparent. Television. I mean, it's clearly Republican television, right? And so Roger Ailes, who, who basically created it for Rupert Murdoch said, you know, I don't want, you know, if, if there's a spectrum of audience, I don't want to compete for it and take my chunk. I don't want all of the left and all of the center and all of the right and a percentage of, of those three categories. Just give me the right mm -hmm. and I'll take it all. And that's what they did. And they've been highly successful in doing it. Now you have fragmentation of the right, you know, with these other cable channels that I, I honestly don't spend any time watching, but like Newsmax or whatever, I, I think yeah. I, I, no, I, I, was can't. A foreign, I was a foreign correspondent for Fox. So I was overseas. I'm Canadian. And, you know, I, I, I just told it like it was. And I think they were happy that they had reporters that were doing that after a mm -hmm. while reporters barely get on the air there. It's, it's all news personalities. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then I think the, the, sort of more mainstream MSNBC and CNN and, and those people found themselves having to swing on the other end of the, the pendulum to balance truth and, and to balance the editorial of the editorial sway of the right. Now, was that the right thing to do? I don't know. I think the jury now, is still out. Now, Dana, you, you said that you have been to Baghdad. You, I, I take it that you were covering the war. What, what, what three stories have you covered that you thought were the most dangerous situations for you? Uh, the Israeli invasion of Ramallah around Arafat's compound, the invasion of Iraq, the invasion of Afghanistan. I've been in and out of Afghanistan dozens of times, so I can tell you lots of stories. So they're all, they've all been, you know, I was in Chechnya, I was in Kosovo. Um, I, I, yeah, it's, I, I have lots of danger stories if you want to. No, no. Was it David Bloom is the one that died in Iraq? Correct. What, but I know that wasn't because of like, it didn't he have like a blood clot or something like that? Yeah, David was, I, I was with the 101st Airborne. Mm -hmm. um, Carrie Sanders was with, with the U.S. Marines. This is for NBC. Mm -hmm. And um, um, there was another correspondent and forgive me. Uh, I, I forget who he was also with the U.S. Marines. <clears throat> and David went with third ID, the, the tanks as they, as they rumbled, you know, hot and heavy towards Baghdad. And he was on a, um, he was going live and he started to get a, you know, a sore in his leg and his producer uh, put him on an international line with a doctor uh, who said, look, you may have a blood clot, you should come out. And my understanding is that David didn't want to come out and they were getting so close to Baghdad and uh, he stayed longer and he took a medical risk and, uh, you know, he paid for it with his life. Do you know another guy that I really, really like a lot uh, that I think he's from the UK is Keir Simmons. Like he is the guy you see like covering all the other stories out there. Um, and, and it seems like they go to him a lot. And I, I really do like his coverage and stuff. Uh, what are some of the other like journalists or, or, or reporters? Because it, when I've worked in radio, I made a name for myself doing the man on the street stuff, getting out there, asking the questions. Like I, I spent almost a month covering the uh, Casey Anthony trial here in Orlando and and made a big name for myself hell even some of the lawyers wrote about me in their book they never mentioned me by name but it's just like reporters now do not do follow-up questions as much or or am i wrong by saying that like because they will ask questions and the person that's answering will give them the complete total runaround and they don't ask a follow-up question like uh you didn't answer anything that i just asked 
Well, I mean, I think that there are lots of great reporters out there. I think international news is so different than what's done in the United States, right? I mean, we cover the news by going to the front line or going someplace that other people haven't gone. And we, we talk to people um, and show things that, you know, maybe the military is not showing that day or, or you know, that, and that's how we, we reveal what's really going on in the, in the battlefield or, um, you know, for instance, when the, the, the invasion of Afghanistan happened after 9-11, um, I, I crossed the border from Tajikistan on a gun run from the Northern Alliance who were fighting the Taliban. And, and we, um, you know, started to say that the Americans were coming in, the bombing had started. Um, but what was important to me is that we saw the effects of 3 million refugees that were displaced people in, in Afghanistan that were on the run, starving to death. And, you know, I would call New York and say, look, we got to do, we have to do this story. And it's just not the good guys and cowboys are coming and the, the bad guys, Al Qaeda is on the run. You know, we, we would pick, to, to me, what being a journalist, you know, is so important is that we were able to shed uh, light on the, the, the tremendous um, heart-wrenching humanitarian situation there. And in the end, President Bush started doing airdrops uh, of food to all of those refugees. Now it was, <laughs> it was a lot of food that like cheese whiz and stuff that they didn't want to eat, but, and it was quite comical in some respects, but I mean, I mean, they, they got food. We, we were able to report on areas where they, they, they should create safe havens. Um, mm -hmm. And so that those people, you know, men, women, children uh, had a place to go. So I, you know, news conference, follow-up questions and all that. I, I think that that's, that's some theater, uh, you know, covering the local city hall or, or, mm -hmm. you know, covering news conferences in New York. And I haven't done a lot of it. I haven't done a lot of it, thankfully, in my career. And I don't want to. Um, what is the story? I mean, this is kind of like asking who your favorite kid is, you know, or whatever. But what is the story you have covered that you are the proudest of? I think stories where you can you can create change rather than rather than just reporting on mayhem. And I think like I've had a few instances in my career like Afghanistan, where we we created change through our reporting that that saved people's lives. I think, um, you know, I reported on a I reported on a a white pine forest in Canada in the far north of Alberta with the Northwest Territories where um, there was an old lease. Uh, you know, this is, I, I'm sure this probably doesn't, it means probably seems, sounds like a silly story compared to me talking about Afghanistan and Iraq and all this. But to me, it was important because they were clear cutting a white pine forest with wolves and bears and um, um, the, the biggest buffalo herd in North America. And the Indians were, Native Indians were being displaced by it all. And we went up and did a series of stories in there, beautiful stories. I mean, because it's a beautiful place, uh, Wood Buffalo National Park. It's the second largest park in the world. Nobody has even heard of it. It has the largest wetland area in the world with a billion birds migrating through it in the summertime. And because of our reporting, the federal government got embarrassed of Canada and they had to buy out the lease. So, you know, there's, I, I have a handful of stories like that on orphans, on different things that, you know, we created change and saved a family or, or saved a forest. And th th those are, I mean, that makes your career worthwhile, but they're few and far between. In, in between those great achievements is just a lot of, you know, grinding it out and, and trying to cover the news as best you can. What are what? Give me an example. Like, uh, what what kind of story are you working on right now at the moment? I'm doing a royal story, um, talking to a editor. Um, actually, he's a he's still an editor of a newspaper here, but he was the royal reporter for one of the tabloids here, and we'll get into a really interesting conversation. I hope about. Um, the, the very questions that you asked me at the beginning of this interview about tabloids and about British journalism and about the royal family. And 
I find that as a journalist, I find that, you know, really intriguing how he's going to answer some of those questions. I'm working, I've just done a story on the ICC, the International Criminal Court, which has now said that they're going to investigate war crimes uh, in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, war crimes against Palestinians. Israel is furious. And I've, we've talked to the Palestinian side, and then we talked to the Israeli side uh, about why one wants the ICC to be there and why the other sees it as something political, anti-Semitic, um, and something that, that shouldn't be occurring. Um, and then I've just done a, just before I talked to you, I, I, I got off with um, somebody from the Sufan Center, um, which is run by a former member of the FBI who carried out some of the interrogations on um, Al-Qaeda and has spoken out against torture. And mm -hmm. we talked a lot about QAnon because they're experts on terrorism um, and also right-wing uh, radical groups. And so we talk a lot about QAnon and I, I had interviewed him in the summertime and so we're, we're updating that now because of everything that's happened in America, you know, especially in light of the what's happened at the Capitol. Uh, let me ask you a couple of last questions on with me right now is Dana Lewis, who is your all time favorite anchor? And it could be it could be worldwide of all time. I mean, Tom Brokaw was a good friend of mine and uh, we interviewed President Putin together. Um, and I appeared on NBC Nightly News with Tom a lot, and I respect Tom, and, and I like him. I also loved Peter Jennings. I, I just think he was one of the most sophisticated, um, eloquent, uh, Canadian, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. host of, at ABC News. Peter Jennings was amazing, and he understood the Middle East. He, he went to, the, to Beirut University. Um, he just had that wondrous ability to take a complicated international story um, on world news tonight and, and boil it down so Americans could understand it and care about it. Whereas a lot of anchors today just go, oh, it's international news. They're never going to understand mm -hmm. Afghanistan or they're never going to understand what's going on, uh, you know, in the, in the Taiwan Straits with China and Taiwan. And so, I mean, Peter Jennings thought, okay, these are important international news stories and we're going to put them on and we're going to explain them in a way that people relate to them but we're going to tell people about the world. And, you know, so much of that has disappeared. So I, I kind of mourn the loss of people like Peter Jennings and shows. Yeah, what about Lester Holt? Do you like Lester? Uh, yeah, I think Lester's all right. I, I, you know, I worked with him a little bit. I don't know him on a personal level very well. I think I, I like I met him at MSNBC when he was there. And I think people tend to like him. And, uh, you know, I, yeah, I think he does a decent job. Well, Dana, I, I tell people once again before we go how they can check out all your online stuff. Well, Backstory with Dana Lewis is a podcast that I started doing in the pandemic. I have lots. I mean, if you Google Dana Lewis, you know, uh, journalist, you'll come up with a zillion things, right? Because I've been doing this for 40 years now. But uh, Backstory is kind of my new creation, um, and I would really like people to listen to it because we will grow it and continue to do international news because I think that there is an appetite. Um, and so that's anywhere you, you look on Stitcher, on, Pod, on Apple, um, on Buzzsprout, you know, just any uh, podcast that you listen to. And then we're also, I'm also doing this newsletter, danalewis.substack.com. Mm -hmm. um, and Substack is a great platform for people wanting to read newsletters and understand, you know, maybe quick reads on complicated matters. And there's some great writers on there. Um, you know, I'm not one of them, but I'm, <laughs> I'm good at boiling down the news in a very short newsletter for you. And I give you the links. So if I say, you know, uh, here in Britain, they're saying this about the royals, I'll give you a couple of links. So you can either, you know, mm -hmm. listen to me, but you can also um, originally source the the news report that I refer to. So I'm not making it up. So you can look at it yeah. and then you can weigh it in your own mind, whether you believe that that report or that take. Um, but generally, you know, I hope to lead people a little closer to the truth. I mean, if, if any of us understand what that is on a daily basis. Dana, you and I know I already said last question, but you brought up being in, in news for 40 years. Um, why is, do you, in your opinion, think that there is a double standard 
when it comes to men versus women in news that men are allowed to age gracefully, but women have a shelf life when it comes to being on camera or being a reporter or an anchor? Well, I mean, I think some women jumped ahead of the line in news using good looks. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was a disservice to them because there are fantastic uh, female journalists all over the world. And I think we, we should be and generally can be weighed equally. You should be judged on your merits as a journalist, on your street smarts, on your writing, on your entrepreneurial ability to dig up stories. Um, I'm not sure there, you know, I wanna say I'm not sure there is a double standard, Tuttle, but there probably, there probably is. I think it depends on the network. The BBC certainly doesn't have it. I, I think, you know, um, there are lots of women who age gracefully on the BBC. Um, do, some of the, do some of the cable stations in America have it? Probably not. I, I, I think you may be right. There may be a double standard. I, I couldn't point to a specific case, but. Oh, local, think, uh, local news, though. It, I, it happens all the time in local news yeah. here. Well, men have to fight that. I mean, I, I would say women have to stand up and fight it. But men we have a responsibility to stand up for our female colleagues uh, and say, look, that person's got the most miles uh, uh, on as a journalist in this newsroom. Um, And they're, they're awesome. And we respect them and we support them. And when we hear rumors that maybe they're going to bring in a 25 year old and push the 45 year old out, we should, we should be the first ones to sound the alarm bell and say, you got your, you know, you got it wrong. Your priorities are wrong. And when, you know what? And it shines through when the big story hits because, you know, the, the best looking people are not the best in a crisis. They are people who have miles and who are decent journalists and have paid their dues. And look, I, I didn't go straight to a war zone. You know, I mean, I started at 20 Uh years old as a crime reporter, then worked the courts. Then I became a parliamentary reporter and covered politics. Then I was a bureau chief in Western Canada. Then I went back to Toronto. Then I became a bureau chief in Jerusalem. Then I was in Moscow for 12 years. I've been on the road for 20 years. I I think um, I'm probably not aging gracefully either. I can tell you it's a good thing. It's a podcast, right? But, you know, I got lots of gray hair, but I think when the, you know, what hits the fan, I can tell you just not that a bomb went off, but I can tell you what it means, how destabilizing it for the government. What are they going to do to, you know, so you bring perspective to the table and there shouldn't be a double standard. Women, men, the news business now, now, total, more than ever, Mm -hmm. needs experienced, decent journalists in there with lots of, you know, lots of miles. And the problem is the networks have cut back and they pay people less, and they want quick fixes, and they hire, you know, a, I, I've had I've had jobs um, where, you know, they, they've said, look, we can bring in a, a 25-year-old man for half of what you make, and, you know, but they haven't been anywhere, they hadn't covered anything, and uh, they'll read AP or Reuters Newswire and do a, do a good-looking stand-up at the end of it, but that's not uh-huh. who you want to watch. If you're a viewer, that's not who you want to watch. That is not the people that you want to trust. And you've got to be a good news consumer mm-hmm. and, you know, reward the people who hire and pay and employ long-term news veterans, because that's where you're going to get the most perspective and it's close to the truth as you can get in that first draft of history. Okay. I'm glad you bring that up. And, and I'm not being insensitive at all but what happened to laura logan in egypt was absolutely horrible but was that a case of you know what what happened there was it was it lack of security did did the did as a reporter when you're in that type of situation you got to read the crowd and be like all right we got to get out of here 
Um, you can be turned on by a crowd, anybody, male, female, in the middle of it, on the edge of it. You try to stay on the edge and move in to, to cover the news. There were radical elements in the crowd. She had security and they were pushed simply outnumbered. Um, and and she was she was grabbed and assaulted in a horrible way. And but at the same time, I can tell you Fox News, Greg Palcott, one of the reporters and a cameraman who I've worked with a, a lot, uh, were also caught by the crowd. They had to spend the night in a building uh, hiding. There were people outside with iron bars waiting to beat them. And in the end, uh, they did have to come out in the morning and the cameraman was was beaten and uh, suffered a concussion. So he, he wasn't sexually assaulted, but he was assaulted and beaten up. Um, and he retired from the news industry after that. that, that do you have a problem? Of, 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 do, hmm? do, do you have a problem with reporters carrying guns? Of course. We're not Wait, combatants. You, We're, no, not but combatants. Uh, what you about for your per, what about for your own protection, though? Doesn't matter. You're supposed to be able to walk between the two sides. So you, you, you'll be able to walk ah. across. a. You cannot be a combatant carrying a weapon or you become an, an even bigger target. And so well, that's always been the philosophy. But in Baghdad, everything changed. We had to have armed compounds and armed guards uh, because it didn't, it didn't matter. We were targets for suicide bombings, for kidnappings. Um, and so suddenly, you know, Fox News, NBC, CNN, there were huge guard compounds. I mean, we had former members of the SAS and Delta uh, that were hired as contractors and carrying, you know, fully, you know, at first the weapons were unofficial, then they became officially sanctioned by the, the news networks. And the, the news networks used to, to cooperate with one another to guard those compounds at night with a, an, you know, an inner circle of, of Western uh, security guards and then an outer circle of, of Iraqis who were doing contract work. But it, a lot of journalists were very uncomfortable with it, but it was the only way to survive. Dana, I I really enjoyed this conversation. I uh, I hope I didn't disappoint you. You know, since you're a seasoned uh, veteran of news journalism, you know I've been working in radio for for 22 years. But I I was really really excited uh, and that I got a chance to be able to speak with you. Well, it's very kind to have me on, Tuttle. Thank you so much. You, you had some great questions and. We covered a hell of a lot of ground, <laughs> and I appreciate yeah. it. And uh, thank you for mentioning my podcast as well. No problem, Dana. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I hope you uh, stay safe out there covering your stories. You too, man. Orlando can be dangerous. <laughs> yeah, you. tell me about no, it. I, I, by the way, I'm a big fan of Florida, and I go. Um, we have a place in in South Florida where we go fishing. My son and I are crazy about oh, crazy about see. fishing, and uh, we're going to be there hopefully this summer after being Man. shot out of the United States for a year because of this crazy, crazy, horrible pandemic. And so, you know, uh, thank you so Have much. You ever caught redfish? Have you ever caught a redfish? Never caught a redfish. Oh, see, if you come over to where I'm at on the East coast, which is Volusia County near Daytona beach, uh, I can, I'll, I'll definitely pitch you on some redfish and they are fun as hell to catch. Cool. That sounds good. I'll, I'll take a, I'll take a, you know, I'll take a mahi mahi or a blackfin tuna and, and, but let's do the redfish. All right, Dana, have a wonderful day, my friend. All the best. From the Vapor Shades Hobo Fish Camp. Man, maybe I would have way more sex partners in my life if I just threw caution to the wind. It's the Tuttle Daily Podcast. The Tuttle's Daily Podcast is brought to you by stitchyouup.com for your embroidery screen printing vinyl and direct to garment printing needs visit stitchyouup.com stitch you up specializes in custom caps shirts decals and anything you want to personalize whether it's one item or large orders they can handle any size unsure about what you want let stitch you up help you with your logo design visit stitchyouup.com or contact them Eric at stitchyouup.com. Stitch you up. Definitely not your grandma's embroidery. Nerd. Radio personality and hot talk satirizer. You're listening to the Tuttle Podcast. All right, guys. Welcome back to the Tuttle Daily Podcast. Last segment of today's show. 
Uh, I wanted to play some audio before I left for the day, and I wanted to get your opinion. That's that's why I always give out my contact, because right now I cannot take live phone calls. Hopefully, one day I will be able to start doing that. I can start doing some live streams, especially on the YouTube channel. But email me, Tuttle at gmail.com, or leave me a voicemail, 407-270-3044. Uh, the audio that I'm about to play for you is that this woman, I guess she is like a dating expert. I don't know how you qualify yourself as a dating expert, but she says the perfect time to wait is 12 dates before you have sex with somebody. And I just don't think people are patient enough nowadays. I also think that women are a little bit more different. Back in the day, I think women wanted to be respected more. They wanted to be courted. You know, I was a late bloomer. I didn't lose my virginity until I was like almost 19 or 20 years old. And But there have been a couple of times, you know, whenever I got big on the radio. <laughs> I know I shouldn't say big, but what I'm trying to say is that it did help me get laid. Uh, maybe one or two chicks that I had sex with them on the night that I met them. Now, do you guys look at women that do that as whores or easy? Because I, I'm, I'm asking, like, can you respect a woman? Is a woman that you want to be your wife or a long-term relationship a girl that slept with you, or woman, that slept with you on the first date. Because none of the relationships that I ever, uh, like, times that I had sex with women that quickly, did it ever work out. I mean, do you, do you lose respect for that woman? Or are we just guys and we, we just, we don't care, we just want to bust a nut? And does the woman lose respect for you? Is the woman just using you for your penis? It's a serious question. I mean, I don't think guys really mind it that much, but I would love to hear from you. What Has it worked out for you? Or, do, or has it worked out for you whenever you've waited? 407-270-3044. I'm a professional matchmaker, and I suggest to my followers and my clients that you should wait 12 days before having sex. In the previous parts, I talked about the math behind how to get to 12 dates. Let's talk about why now. So when you have sex, you release this hormone called oxytocin, also known as the cuddle hormone. And if you're a woman, you can quite literally become blind. Yeah, you become blind by that dick. To seeing all the red flags or pink flags of the person you're dating. So my suggestion is to just wait a little bit. Discover if you actually like this person and figure out if they have the red flags you're not looking for. What do I mean by that? Figure out what they're like on a bad day what they're like on a good day, what they're like when you're having a bad day, and more importantly, what they're like when you're having a good day. By intentionally spending time dating, talking, you'll discover a lot of that. See, I think it's just more about what you're looking for. I think women today, even though they might, might not admit it, are just as horny as men. And I think that's probably why these couples are hooking up more. You know, women want to be treated equal. If guys can go out and bang everybody that they want to, why can't the women? What, why are women considered whores if they sleep with somebody early? But if a guy does it, you're like, hell yeah, your boys are giving you fist bumps and dabs. Yeah, of course. So, in closing... I just say it is what you're looking for. Some people just want to get laid. And that's it. Hope you guys enjoyed today's show. Going to do a live stream tonight on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Tuttle. Hope you guys enjoyed today's show, and I will talk to you on Monday. And that's the show for today. Thanks for listening to the Tuttle Daily Podcast. Hey, don't be a dickhead. Do us a favor. Like, share, and subscribe to the show. Also, check out the Tuttle category at 315live.com. The Tuttle Daily Podcast is brought to you by the Vapor Shades Hobo Fish Camp. 
You want some cool-ass sunglasses? Check out Vaporshades.com. Also brought to you by Starfire Transport, StitchYouUp.com, PocketPairClub.com. Special thanks to show intern Hannah and Charlie Lamo for their contributions. Additional imaging and production is provided by CCA Productions. Facebook.com slash CCA Productions presents. Show voiceover service is brought to you by jcvoiceover.com. That guy's got a damn sexy voice. You should hire him. Check out jcvoiceover.com. If you want to help support the show, go to paypal.me slash Tuttle on the Radio. Comments? Concerns? Or do you just want to let Tuttle know he's being a dickhead? Tuttle at gmail.com. That's Tuttle with two Ds at gmail.com. Leave a voicemail at 407-270-3044. To follow all of Tuttle's social media, go to Tuttle.net. Thanks again for all your support, and we'll see you tomorrow on the Tuttle Daily Podcast. Hey, yo, Terry, what's going on?